Uh, I'm from Greensburg, Louisiana. My family's been there. Uh, my family's been there for hundreds of years. And uh, I went to Greensburg Grammar School. Uh, my favorite teacher, seventh grade teacher, was my mother. Uh, because she was very difficult on me and uh, she uh, instilled on me several things. Number one, if you go into something, give it all you got. Number two, always, always say it like it is and always, if you take a course, get everything you can out of the course because if you don't, someone is cheated, that person is you. You are cheated if you don't get everything that you can get out of the course. Uh, I was born to the Lady of the Lake uh, in Baton Rouge in June 17, 1935. And you know, the old saying, you return to your roots, the First Circuit Court of Appeals is sitting on exactly the spot that I was born. She was tremendous encouragement to me in every way. Since my father died in 1939, she was mother and father to me and my two older brothers. And uh, she always encouraged me to work hard. Don't do anything that you don't plan to give it your very best. You have to give it your very best and always, always try to do the right thing. Just about every member of my family graduated from Southeastern. My wife, my daughter, my son, uh, my two brothers graduated from Southeastern and in a group, uh, uh, Dr. Randy Moffitt, who was president of Southeastern at the time. Somebody asked, uh, so Judge Carter, why, why is it that you didn't go to Southeastern? And, and Dr. Moffitt said, I think I can answer that. He said, and he and I are very close friends, and he said, uh, I believe that, that Judge Carter went to LSU thinking it was SLU, and when he found out the difference, he couldn't leave, so. <laughs> 1958. Uh, I graduated from LSU Law School, Paul M. Mayberry Center. And at that time, Professor Bow, there was, LSU had a combined curriculum. If you had 100 hours of undergraduate and good grades, you could get into law school. So in two years, I accumulated my 100 hours and got into law school. And so my total uh, time at LSU undergraduate and law school was five years. Uh, Helen's sister, Rose Bridges Webb, and I started the first grade together. The only two that graduated started the first grade and graduated. Helen was two years younger than her sister, and uh, we started uh, uh, courting in high school, and we uh, continued to uh, be boyfriend, girlfriend. She went to Southeast and graduated, and uh, uh, we. Uh, she taught school she, in the, uh, first in the public school system and then in the community and technical college system, of which now she's on the board of supervisors and has been for many, many years. After I graduated and was admitted to practice, uh, I joined the National Guard and uh, very quickly was sent to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas for basic training. That was in 1959, and from Fort Chaffee, I was transferred to Fort Hart, California, to the Basic Army Administration School. In between, I had a little leave and delay. Helen and I got married, my Helen Bridges and I got married. We'd been sweethearts for a long, long time. And uh, so then I went to the Basic Army Administration School uh, at Fort Hart, California. And when I graduated, they kept me in the school. And so I stayed at the uh, Basic Army Administration School until I uh, was released from active duty. Uh, then I came back and I found out in, uh, I believe it was 1960 or 61, that the Army Reserve Unit in Baton Rouge needed a judge advocate officer. So I applied, was accepted, got a direct commission as a first lieutenant in the judge advocate. And I believe I was sworn in on Saturday and activated for the Berlin crisis uh, the following Monday. And I spent a year at Fort Polk, post, post claimed officer. I also got to attend the Judge Advocate General School uh, at uh, Fort Charlottesville, Virginia, graduated the civil law course. And uh, 
uh, my tour at uh, Fort Polk was very, very interesting. I came back and started practicing law in Greensburg and practiced until October 15, 1974. My first job was opening a law office in Greensburg and also being part-time law clerk for Judge Bob Ellis, who was chief judge of the First Circuit Court of Appeal. So I, I did a, some work for him and I had an uh, office in Greensburg. My father's office building was one office uh, and a waiting room, and it was rented to a very nice gentleman by the name of Bill Alford. And my mother, when I graduated and, and she knew I was going to open an office in Greensburg, she said, I'll move him out and you can have your daddy's old law. I said, no, we don't do it. She said, well, I'd rather not. But she said, where are you going to go? So w my, my grandmother on my father's side had the old Carter Hotel building, which was a three-story frame building that had been vacant for years. I took the hall and divided it into a waiting room and my office. I, I was appointed by Governor Edwards, Edwin Edwards, to Division A of the 21st Judicial District Court. And I immediately was sworn in and uh, Judge Warren Comey swore me in with the other judges. And within a few months, an election was called. At that time, I had no opposition. Served the rest of that term and served another term without an opposition. Then the legislature created a system whereby criminal cases would go to the courts of appeal except in capital murder cases. So they created a new judgeship. And uh, on the First Circuit, Division D, Third District First Circuit was the area that I was in. So I ran for it. And my good friend, who was a trial judge over in uh, 22nd, Steve Dutza, ran. And during the campaign, he never had a bad word to say about me, and I never had a bad word to say about him. In fact, at one of our gatherings, one of my supporters called me and said, said, Judge, said, who are you for? You are Judge Dutza. I said, all you said is nice things about him. Well, he's a nice fella. So uh, fortunately, uh, I, I was elected. The courtroom was filled, and you could shoot a 22 rifle down the center with one side being African-American and the other side being white. And the person charged was a gentleman, I have his permission to tell this because he's still living. Frank Johnson was charged with stealing the dog of the white guy, Willie Travis. So, the state put on its case, and uh, the evidence was not there. That they did not prove that Frank Johnson stole the dog beyond a reasonable doubt. So there's a murmur in the courtroom, and the law enforcement officials came up and said, Judge, said, we got a problem. Said, that blue tick hound is tied downstairs. Who do we give it to? Do we give it to Mr. Travis or Mr. Johnson? And said, if, if, if something isn't done, we may have some real problems in, uh, in the courthouse square. And, and uh, so I said, well, let me ask you this. Would you, each side, stipulate in writing? And I thought about King Solomon and the baby, and I, I knew that, that nobody would believe that I'd cut that dog in half. <laughs> so, so I said, I'll tell you what, I'll let Mr. Travis get in one back corner of the courtroom and Mr. Johnson in the other back corner of the courtroom. Bring the blue tick hound up and put that blue tick hound in the very center on the back row of the courtroom. And I'll waive all rules of court. And each side can whistle, call, clap, do anything they want. And whoever the dog goes to, I will declare the owner of the dog. This was all stipulated to, everybody agreed to it. And I said, I said, this is unusual, highly unusual. So they brought the blue tick hound up and, they, and the procedure started. And lo and behold, the blue tick hound starts toward me, the judge. And I said, well, I, I don't want him. Put him back, put him back. And put him back against the wall. And this continued, and he picked one. He picked the African-American 
he went to him. So I declared him that he's the owner of the dog. I have been on the first circuit, I was on the first for 31 years, the last 11 years as chief judge of the, of the first circuit. And uh, had many, many interesting cases. And let me just say this for the record for sure. Every case as a trial judge on the Court of Appeals, no matter how small or how little significance it might have, was important to me because I knew that it was important to the litigants and the lawyers. Christine Brennan was convicted under the obscenity statute. She had a sex toy shop in Mandeville and later moved it out. And she was convicted on two counts of violating the state law on obscenity. And the appeal comes up and after reviewing the obscenity statute, my panel determined that we had to declare it unconstitutional that uh, it violated the First Amendment and all kinds of, of rights. One of my friends called me and he said, Judge, said, you know, you made Playboy. <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord, what are they going to say next? And he said, oh, yes, they did. So the next morning I was headed to Hound. And at that time in St. Lena Parish, you couldn't buy a magazine like that. So uh, I was going to Hammond to meet, have lunch with Judge Leon Ford, my dear friend on the trial court. And I stopped at the Circle K in A meet to, uh, and I waited and people come, hi judge, how you doing, how you, I waited for it to clear out. And once it was clear, I go up to the little lady behind the uh, counter and I said, where are your magazines? She said, judge, we have them back here, but I know you don't want any of those magazines. And I said, yes ma'am, do you have a Playboy? Yes, I have a Playboy. I said, I'd like to buy two of them. And, she said, I said, I'm written up in. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I bought the Playboy, and the article about me and the Playboy started off highly complimentary. And then it went, when, it, when they got to my specially concurring opinion, uh, uh, they were not very complimentary. Sarah Edmondson and her boyfriend, Benjamin Darris, came to Louisiana from Oklahoma. They watched the, the movie Natural Born Killers time and time again. Came to Ponchatoula, robbed and shot uh, the lady that was uh, running this, the store. Uh, Patsy Ann Byers was her name and severely injured her. She later died, but not from the injuries received from uh, the, this event. And the the suit was filed on behalf of Patsy Ann Byers and her family, and it included, of course, uh, Sarah Edmondson. But Oliver Stone and Time Warner were the producers and directors and so forth of the, of the movie Natural Born Killers. We had to watch it. I, I, I thought it was a terrible movie, but we, we watched it. And we determined that because it there was no proof that the Oliver Stone Time Warner intended this to incite violence that it could not, she could not recover against them. Governor Edwin Edwards appointed me to the bench in 1974. And I knew of his, uh, and I thought his first term as governor, he was excellent, but things didn't go well after that and I know that he had had his problems with the law. But I felt like since he had appointed me that he definitely should be specially invited to my retirement ceremony. So I did, I specially invited uh, Edwin Edwards and I gave him an opportunity. I called on him to say a few words and he kind of danced his way up to the podium and he said, you know, said, I've been in a lot of courses, first time I ever came by invitation. <laughs> and he brought the house down. Retirement has advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is that, the advantages are that uh, you don't have, when I was a judge, I was a judge 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't have that anymore. But I do, I enjoy getting appointed by the Supreme Court to both the trial court, 
Court of Appeals, and even the Supreme Court. I, I sat in as, on the Supreme Court. Uh, one of the justice, Justice Crichton, uh, recused on a capital murder case, and I was appointed and sat, and we rendered the opinion. Uh, I'd like to be remembered as a hard-working judge that always gave it his best, ruled in accordance with the law and, the and, and especially the Constitution's uh, as best I knew.